Hi everyone, this is the uh, rationalization of our free online quiz on carbohydrates and diabetes mellitus. I'm Dr. Gab Pascual, I'm the team leader for Legend Review Center. So uh, before we start with our ratio, we just like to let everyone know that we are offering an online ASCP intensive review. Uh, one of our batches started last May to already. But if you still want to join that program, we can still accommodate you. And we'll still be having other batches in the next months to come. We also have our uh, local board review for both our Baguio and Pampanga branches. So if you're interested in any of these programs, you can visit our Facebook page or you can contact us using the uh, details we have here on the slide. Now before we start with the ratio, if you have not answered the quiz yet, you can find the link to the quiz on the description of this video. So take the quiz, you'll get your score, you'll get a copy of the exam, then go back to this video to learn more about these questions. Okay, so let's start. This is the first question. Maltose, lactose, and sucrose are all, of course these are all disaccharides. Now remember, your carbohydrates can be classified according to the number of units that they have. Monosaccharides are the simplest, followed by disaccharides which are comprised of two monosaccharides joined together by a glycosidic bond. Then you have oligosaccharides which are comprised of 3 to 10 monosaccharides. And of course, polysaccharides which are comprised of more than 10. Now choice A is incorrect since your sucrose is non-reducing although maltose and lactose are reducing. So the correct answer here is letter C. So this would be the composition of these three disaccharides. Let's go to the next slide. So all of the following describe type 2 diabetes mellitus except letter C, requires insulin therapy to control hyperglycemia. Now, remember that type 2 diabetes mellitus is more of a problem in the insulin receptors there is insulin resistance because of these defective receptors. So what happens is the pancreas actually compensates by producing more insulin. So the patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus actually do not need insulin to control hyperglycemia. It would be the type 1 patients who have absolute insulin deficiency. Remember, in type 1, the problem is autoimmune destruction of beta cells. So you really have to give the pa uh, patient insulin to control hyperglycemia. However, cl uh, class, type 2 diabetes patients eventually require insulin once their uh, disease becomes more severe. So this table differentiates type 1 from type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, the various categories of diabetes mellitus, we also have another video discussing diabetes. So you can uh, watch that video instead. This is just a continuation of that table. Let's go to the next question. So which set of analytes would most likely be increased in a type 1 diabetic patient? So the answer here would be ketone bodies and blood glucose. So this is a type 1 patient, so you expect insulin to be decreased or deficient. So A and B are both incorrect. Letter D is also incorrect since the blood pH in type 1 patients undergoing crisis would be decreased. They would be undergoing acidosis. So the uh, answer here would be letter C. Okay, so let's briefly discuss the BT ketoacidosis. The BT ketoacidosis is a hallmark of type 1 diabetes mellitus. Usually, the BT ketoacidosis is triggered by severe stress such as in cases of infection. In severe stress, the patient secretes high amounts of epinephrine which eventually stimulates glucagon secretion. Now, glucagon increases lipolysis or fat breakdown. If you have increased fat breakdown or lipolysis, there will be increased free fatty acids which are then converted by the liver to ketone bodies. Remember, you have three ketone bodies. These are beta-hydroxybutyric acid, acetoacetic acid, acetone. Okay? Three ketone bodies. Now, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis usually manifests with hyperglycemia elevated anion gap due to the presence of the ketone bodies, metabolic acidosis, as well as hyperkalemia. Okay, next question. 
which of the following statements about diagnosing uh, GDM is correct? So, there are four categories of diabetes mellitus. You have type 1, type 2, GDM, and other specific types of diabetes. When you say gestational diabetes mellitus, this is diabetes first diagnosed during pregnancy. If a mother is already diabetic, then the mother can no longer be diagnosed as GDM because by definition, when you say GDM, this is diabetes with first onset or first detection during pregnancy. So the correct ha answer here would be letter B. All non-diabetic pregnant women should be screened for GDM at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation. Letter C and letter D are incorrect since uh, letter C talks about diabetic women already who are uh, who should not be screened or who are understood already to be diabetic. Letter D includes diabetic women. Okay, so letter B is the best answer here. Letter A is incorrect since uh, the diagnostic criteria for GDM is different for the diagnosis of the other types of diabetes. So GD GDM is glucose intolerance with onset or first recognition during pregnancy, and this is due to metabolic and hormonal changes. A large per percent of patients develop diabetes mellitus within 5 to 10 years. Okay, so if a mother gets GDM, you have to warn the mother to be careful or to be watchful of her lifestyle because she has an increased risk to develop another form of diabetes within, uh, within 5 to 10 years. Now, the problem with GDM is that the mother as well as the uh, fetus will have many complications. So like for example, you have RDS or respiratory distress syndrome, hypocalcemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and other complications. So it is very important for us to screen for GDM during the course of pregnancy. And that screening is done at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation. Screening is usually done using R2 or OGTT using a 75 gram glucose load. But of course, that would depend on what uh, protocol is being used by the uh, doctor of the patient. Uh, if you're doing your 2 or OGTT, the patient should be fasting for at least 8 hours prior to the test. Then you have here the diagnostic criteria. At least one of these three criteria should be met okay, during the OGTT. Next question. Patient has fasting plasma glucose performed at the laboratory. He has fasted as instructed. FPG is 135 mg per deciliter. What does this result indicate and what further action is recommended by the ADA? So the correct answer is letter A. Elevated FPG needs further evaluation by a repeat or alternative test. Okay? Now if you are diagnosing diabetes mellitus, the recommended test would be your fasting plasma glucose. However, the ADA recommends that if you get an elevated FPG, you do it uh, some other day again. You, you repeat it some other day. So you need at least two elevated FPG or another test to diagnose diabetes mellitus. So hyperglycemia should be demonstrated by a second time by any of the four criteria below. Unless the glucose level is significantly high and diabetes is unquestionable. So you have here the diagnostic criteria. If you're using the HbA1c, the cutoff value is 6.5% for you to diagnose diabetes. For the fasting plasma glucose, that would be 126 mg per deciliter. For the OGTT with the 2R post load, the cutoff value is 200 mg per deciliter. Then for your random plasma glucose, it would be 200 mg per deciliter plus symptoms of diabetes. This table shows you again the diagnostic criteria which we have mentioned. Aside from that, you also have here the levels for pre-diabetes, okay? So pre-diabetes is between normal and diabetes mellitus cutoff levels, okay? So for your fasting plasma glucose, pre-diabetes or impaired fasting glucose is from 100 to 125. For two hour plasma glucose level, it would be from 140 to 199. And for HbA1c, it would be 5.7 to 6.4. Okay, next, six months ago, a 65-year-old old female had a fasting plasma glucose greater than 200 mg per deciliter on two occasions. She was diagnosed as having type 2 diabetes and treatment was started along with routine FPGs. Which of the following tests should be used to monitor glycemic control? Of course, this would be, this would be your HbA1c or your glycosylated hemoglobin. Okay. 
So, HbA1c is used to monitor the average blood glucose concentration over the previous 3 months. And this would reflect the lifespan of your RBCs. Every 1% increase in the HbA1c uh, corresponds to an increase of 35 milligrams per deciliter in the average plasma glucose. The ADA recommends that HbA1c is tested at least twice a year to monitor long-term glycemic control or control over the previous three months. Now, you have to be uh, aware that your HbA1c can be falsely decreased due to a decreased RBC lifespan. Like for example, if the patient has hemolytic anemia or any hemolytic uh, disorder which can decrease the RBC lifespan. Since your HbA1c is formed, throughout the life of, uh, of your red blood cells. So if the lifespan of the RBC is decreased, there will be a decreased opportunity for hemoglobin to be glycosylated, causing now your false decrease. Next question, HbA1c result of a diabetic patient is 6.0%. What conclusion can be made regarding this patient's carbohydrate management? So the correct answer here is letter C. Patient is compliant with diet and medication. Now, if the patient was already diagnosed with diabetes, the HbA1c level or the HbA1c target is less than 7%. Okay? Uh, while you're monitoring the patient, you have to see the, the HbA1c becoming less than 7%. For you to say that the patient is... Uh, has controlled diabetes mellitus. Okay, so that's the target for HbA1c, less than 7%. Okay, so HbA1c result that is less than 7% indicates glycemic control. This is according to the American Diabetes Association. Which analyte is measured to detect early nephropathy in a diabetic patient? So this would be albumin in the urine. Diabetic patients develop over time, diabetic kidney disease, which may be delayed by aggressive glycemic control. Of course, provided that you're able to detect diabetic kidney disease early. An early indicator to diabetic kidney disease is the uh, detection of albumin in the urine. It is recommended that diabetic patients be tested for albu albuminuria at least yearly. So the recommendation for albumin detection in the urine would be annual. Next, which of the following additives inhibit glycolysis? So the answer here would be sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride is found in your gray top tubes and its purpose is to inhibit glycolysis. Contrary to what most people know, sodium fluoride is not an anticoagulant. Okay? Its primary use in the gray top would be as an anti-glycolytic agent. Now, how does it uh, work? Your sodium fluoride binds to magnesium ions which are needed by the enzyme enolase. Okay? By binding to magnesium ions, you also inhibit the enzyme enolase, which is part of the glycolytic pathway. Next, whole blood glucose values are blank uh, plasma glucose values. So your whole blood glucose values are about 11% lower than your plasma glucose values. This is according to Bishop. Now, if you're using Henry, this would be a range. This would be 10 to 15% lower than plasma glucose levels. This is important to know since your POCTs, your point of care tests for glucose, usually use whole blood. As a result, you expect that your whole blood glucose would be lower than the plasma glucose values. So your POCT uh, actually compensates for this. They, they automatically correct the value of your uh, glucose prior to presenting the result. So again, remember, whole blood glucose levels are about 11% lower or 10 to 15% lower. Next question. A blood specimen is received in the laboratory for testing 5 hours after collection. Which of the following test results would be falsely decreased in serum or plasma? So obviously, this would be glucose. Okay. So serum or plasma should be removed from the cells as soon as possible after collection. The reason for this is that your cells, even though they're already uh, in your specimen, they are still metabolically active. So they can still consume the glucose in your specimen, causing now a false 
decrease. So if the specimen is not centrifuged within the first two hours after collection, certain test results may be invalid. Okay? Serum or plasma glucose test results may be decreased while lactate dehydrogenase, creatinine, and potassium will be increased. At room temperature, please take note of this, the rate of glucose metabolism is at 7 mg per deciliter per hour. Whereas at 4 degrees Celsius or at around ref temperature, it would be 2 mg per deciliter per hour. So if you, if you leave your sample for 5 hours, you expect that at room temperature, the level of glucose will decrease by around 35. That's 7 times 5 hours. Or if you put it at the ref, there, would, uh, there will be a decrease of around 10 mg per deciliter already after 5 hours. So next. Which of the following would be considered a normal CSF glucose level if the serum glucose is 70 mg per deciliter? Now, for you to be able to answer this, you need to know the uh, CSF glucose level relative to the glucose in plasma or serum. Okay? So, as a general rule, CSF glucose level is about two-thirds of your serum, glu serum glucose or around 60 to 70%. So for a patient with the serum glucose of 70 mg per deciliter, the range which you expect would be from 42 to 49. Now for the choices that you have here in the question, the only choice which falls in this range would be 45 mg per deciliter. So this would be your uh, answer, letter B. Okay. Now what if the actual glucose level in the CSF is below this range. So usually, we, sh we see low CSF glucose levels in cases of meningitis, particularly in bacterial meningitis. Okay? So that is the reason why whenever you measure CSF glucose levels, you also need to get your serum or plasma glucose levels for comparison. Okay? So that would be it for this quiz. I hope uh, you got a high score in this quiz. Uh, if you think this quiz is useful, comment below or like this video and please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much.